Well, I think the time is now 10 a.m. And so uh, good morning from sunny Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, my name is Daniel Lee and uh, thrilled to be part of this really fantastic Corona Initiative uh, lecture series uh, hosted by the University of Kentucky Department of Otolaryngology. Uh, thanks to Dr. Comer and his uh, colleagues in the department, uh, as well as to Dr. Aaron Remschneider for the invitation and opportunity to speak. Uh, today on one of my favorite topics, which is superior uh, canal dehiscence uh, syndrome. Uh, so uh, I'm sitting here virtually in front of the uh, a Master's of Science Infirmary, as uh, shown here. Uh, this is the Mass General Hospital. Uh, over here, uh, uh, just to the next to uh, the Mass Sciencer, is our local watering uh, hole, the Liberty Hotel. Uh, also behind me are the uh, uh, Teddy Abersall uh, Red Sox fields. These are uh, baseball and uh, softball fields uh, that were named after Teddy Abersall, uh, the son of a well-known NBC sports executive. Uh, this child unfortunately died in a very tragic plane crash a number of years ago. Um, uh, but was um, uh, less tragic, but uh, notable uh, that happened on these fields. Um, uh, was actually a kickball tournament uh, between the otolaryngology faculty and the residents and fellows, and uh, it didn't end well. Uh, blood was shed, and um, uh, the attendings, of course, won the tournament, and, um, uh, but the trainees did not fare well. I watched uh, one of the facial plastics fellows uh, face plant on his way to first base. Uh, two of our residents injured their hands, and so they couldn't even operate or scrub in because of the injuries. And my own neurotology fellow actually um, towards hamstring had to limp away from the fields. And so uh, anyway, just a little story about, uh, about the geography of where I'm sitting uh, right now. So uh, thrilled to talk about my favorite topic, uh, superior canal dehiscence uh, syndrome today. And I hope to, to provide uh, just a basic overview in terms of the nuts and bolts of the condition, how it presents, how we can diagnose it, treatment options, and then go through some illustrative cases that highlight when surgery may or may not be indicated. So I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here. And um, let's see if this works here. Great. Okay, I hope this is working and hope that the audio feed is um, reliable as well. So superior canal dehiscence uh, syndrome. These are my financial disclosures, uh, which none have any direct relationship to the topic that I'm presenting uh, this morning. So briefly, I'll talk about the clinical presentation of canal dehiscence, review our radiologic classification of superior canal dehiscence based on uh, CT scan findings, review surgical management options, discuss outcomes, and then in part two of this lecture, I will uh, review some representative cases of superior uh, canal dehiscence. And so as many of you know, this unusual condition, superior canal dehiscence, was first identified and really characterized by Lloyd Minor in 1998 when he was at Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital. I was a medical student uh, resident, and he was then my fellowship director afterwards. And so I was very uh, thrilled to be able to work with uh, someone of his expertise and, um, and his innovative thinking about trying to link with very unusual conditions with very specific physical exam findings, namely patients who had eye movements that were driven by certain stimuli in the plane of the superior canal. He then uh, collaborated with colleagues, I believe in New York, uh, to help perform the adequate CT scan reconstructions to be able to look for defects in the superior canal. And just like the famous Reese's uh, butter peanut cup, you know, uh, tooth together, CT scan findings, vestibular physical exam findings, and indeed he identified a new syndrome, superior canal dehiscence a syndrome. On the left side, we see a view of the superior canal on CT scan showing a bony defect that interoperatively was found to be a clear cut, a lack of bone over the arcuate eminence of the superior canal in this left ear of a 29 year old woman who had postpartum vertigo as her initial presenting complaint associated uh, with uh, the beginning of her SCD symptoms, and she did well after surgery. The incidence is not uh, known entirely, but temporal bone studies suggest that anywhere from 0.5 to 2% of these uh, specimens were found to have a bony defect. In clinical studies, uh, looking at CT scan surveillance, anywhere from 3 to 9%. Of course, we don't know of uh, those patients how many actually have uh, symptomatic canal dehiscence syndrome. 
And it's important to understand that SCD syndrome can present with either vestibular and or auditory symptoms. And uh, so uh, many people believe that the um, condition really only causes dizziness if it's really um, uh, a main uh, contributor to a patient's presenting complaints. In fact, an important group of patients in our own cohort here in Boston are patients who have primarily auditory symptoms. And it is the auditory symptoms that are very severe that oftentimes motivate patients to consider a surgical management plan. And when Lloyd Minor was first um, uh, managing these patients uh, well over 20 years ago, uh, there was a concern about operating on anyone except for those patients who had complex vestibular symptomatology for fear of performing surgery and, and causing hearing loss or permanent auditory deficits. Um, I will tell you that now um, we are seeing more and more patients who are presenting with auditory symptoms as their primary complaint. So when they do have vestibular issues, oftentimes it's vertigo or dizziness or oscillopsia triggered by sound known as tulio phenomenon or by pressure, a Hennebert's sign. Other common symptoms, hearing one's eyeball move is a very specific complaint that uh, oftentimes brings patients uh, to clinics. They will put this complaint into the Google search engine and out comes superior canal dehiscence syndrome. Autophony, fullness, hearing loss, pulse saltiness, these are less specific complaints that oftentimes don't generate the successful identification of superior canal dehiscence as a possible diagnosis. But when patients have uh, a complaint of hearing their eyeballs move or their joints creaking, um, and that oftentimes yields a successful finding of SCD on their search engine, which then motivates them to find a clinic that manages these sorts of patients. And so just to recap, SCDS patients can have symptoms that are both auditory or vestibular or one or the other. You do not have to be dizzy to have symptomatic superior canal dehiscence syndrome. So in the normal inner ear, in normal uh, mechanoacoustic dynamics of the human inner ear, we have two mobile windows, the oval and round windows. It's a push-pull system to be able to maintain normal sensitive hearing. We believe that superior canal distance drives a third window phenomenon in which there is preferential shunting of acoustic energy away from the cochlear partition and towards the amplated end of the superior canal causing dizziness and towards the area of the bony defect. And so when this occurs, there's a decrease in inner ear pressure away from the cochlear partition that reduces the cochlear input causing subjective hearing loss and, and inner ear conductive hearing loss. With shunting of this acoustic flow, there's increased input across the ampulla of the superior canal generating vestibular symptoms. So, so this is the widely supported theory of how superior canal dehiscence causes auditory and vestibular symptoms. This is a patient from our practice, 42 years old, who presented initially with a left-sided hearing loss complaint. Her threshold uh, uh, hearing test is shown here, which demonstrates an air bone gap with the mixed component. This patient has a left-sided mixed hearing loss. And so what else do you want to know about her evaluation? Well, she has normal examination, so normal otoscopy, normal tympanometry. So this argues against otitis media with effusion, uh, eustachian tube dysfunction, et cetera. And we also want to obtain, of course, acoustic uh, reflexes. And so these were normal and present. So based upon these findings, we would probably consider that this patient does not have a middle ear source for her conductive hearing loss, <clears throat> which then narrows it down to potentially an inner ear phenomenon, perhaps a third window. So what's in her differential? No question, left-sided superior canal dehiscence. But what else? Large vestibular aqueduct. Do not forget that the large vestibular aqueduct finding on MRI scan or CT scan can act as a third window, very similar to superior canal dehiscence. So this is the scan from this same patient. So this patient <clears throat> has a mixed hearing loss or an air bone gap likely associated with her large vestibular aqueduct. And don't forget that in children who present with a conductive hearing loss and a normal exam, that not all of them need a tympanostomy tube. 
once you've performed tympanometry to rule out eustachian tubus function <clears throat> and acoustic reflexes to rule out any sort of ossicular chain abnormalities, please scan your children with the conductive hearing loss that is unexplained by your testing errors, physical examination. You do not want to miss a large vestibular aqueduct diagnosis in a child. And often children with large aqueducts present with an air bone gap or a mixed hearing loss. Again, the air bone gap is being driven by a third wound of phenomena caused by the large vestibular aqueduct. Etiology of superior canal distance um, is not quite understood um, fully. Um, arguments for congenital are that there's a fairly high prevalence of canal dehiscence in children under the age of two. Of course, we also know that the skull base doesn't fully develop um, um, uh, until age three or four or even older. That prevalence, however, does decrease over the first decade of life as more bone is laid down upon the lateral skull base. Uh, there doesn't appear to be evidence of bony remodeling in five cases of canal dehiscence and 14 near dehiscence cases. And this is a temporal bone of pathology study uh, performed uh, in uh, Baltimore. So that argues against acquired etiology. Uh, familial canal dehiscence has been reported, although rare. And there appears to be a high prevalence of canal dehiscence seen in some patients with Usher syndrome 1D. In the acquired camp, uh, there is bony remodeling that has been seen on otopathology specimens. And we recently reported a case that we presented at a webinar uh, through our lab at Mass Pioneer about two years ago. Uh, in other studies, they've shown evidence of osteoclastic activity in the temporal bone in the area of the canal dehiscence. Um, there's, there are limited genetic and familial cases that have been reported so far. In up to a quarter of cases or more, the onset uh, was associated with some degree of head trauma. Uh, there's also a possible association with elevated intracranial pressure, in other words, SCD findings associated with higher BMI as well as obstructive sleep apnea. However, a published paper from our institution suggests that those patients who have severe symptoms requiring surgery do not have high BMIs. So the jury's out, the story is not complete, and certainly more studies on larger groups of patients and certainly families of patients with this condition are going to be extremely helpful to better understand the underpinnings of what causes superior canal dehiscence. This was a small report that we uh, published about six years ago uh, in three different families, uh, two brothers, a mother and daughter combination for the other two, showing evidence radiologically of superior canal dehiscence uh, um, defects, as well as uh, symptoms and signs and testing suggesting active superior canal dehiscence syndrome in these three separate families. So evaluation with audiometry is extremely important. And this includes beginning with the threshold audiogram. And here we're looking for a low frequency air bone gap. And in some cases we can observe a supra normal bone conduction line. And so I'm oftentimes asked, what are ways that we can better screen for a third window phenomena in our patient population without having to expose patients to additional scans? or maybe you don't have VEM testing available at our center. Well, re, uh, discuss this with your audiologists and make sure that they are performing supra normal bone conduction at minus five or minus 10 dB. And you may pick up some additional patients who have ear symptoms suggesting SCD and have uh, perhaps normal thresholds, but when tested with supra normal bone conduction, you might even open up and see an air bone gap suggesting hypersensitivity to bone conduction, which is oftentimes seen in patients with SCD syndrome. Tympanometry. Usually we see that the findings are normal. In a few cases, we see hypermobility. And this might relate to the fact that if there is lowered inner ear impedance from the third window phenomenon, that that might increase the mobility of the stapes foot plate, which translates into some hypermobility of the drum. So we have seen this in some patients with very large bony defects. It's not a common finding, however. Most cases have normal tympanometry if there are no exam findings to suggest uh, that there might be an outer or middle ear pathology. Acoustic reflexes, critical, right? We want to use these sound-driven reflexes that measure the movement of the uh, stapes and stapedial muscle activity um, to be able to understand if this is a middle ear problem or an inner ear condition. And so oftentimes these reflexes are present in those patients in whom we suspect a third window from canal dehiscence, but reflexes can also be absent. So don't forget there are rare patients that can have both superior canal dehiscence 
and stapes fixation or osteocular fixation. And so we have a few cases um, from our practice who underwent uneventful successful stapes surgery who then uh, unmasked a new symptom complex um, of SCD and their post-op CT scans showed not only otosclerosis, but also showed a bony defect of the superior uh, canal. And so we as a group have begun to more routinely offer imaging pre-op for any patient with an air bone gap who's considering a transcanal tympanotomy um, for possible otosclerosis or another ossicular condition, just to make sure we're not missing the occasional third window. Because um, there is some reluctance to want to go ahead and repair an SCD in patients who've had a stapedectomy. The idea is that you're not performing another inner ear procedure and potentially increasing the risk of surgery, namely sensory neural hearing loss. What about vestibular evoked myogenic potentials? A test I think many of you have heard of and are oftentimes being used in evaluating patients in whom you suspect canal dehiscence. There are two main types of these VEMPs. Uh, one is called the C-VEMP, uh, stands for cervical vestibular evoked myogenic potentials. It is a sound triggered inhibitory response of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So your patient has to be um, positioned such that they can maximally contract the ipsilateral sternocleidomastoid muscle. It's an assay or a test of saccular function. It's a test of inferior vestibular nerve integrity. And in patients with SCD syndrome, these CVEMPs are, they are low threshold. Now, if you see a readout of these, oftentimes you'll see a large amplitude response as well, but that's not as reliable an indicator of a positive response. The key response on cervical VEMPs is looking at the threshold responses compared to your normative data. And so in patients with third windows, not all, but oftentimes they will have a low threshold cervical VEMP. Uh, I don't have a slide on ocular vamps, but ocular vamps are a uh, air or bone conduction triggered response of uh, the extraocular muscles, and it's an assay of utricular function or superior vestibular nerve function. And in the case of SCD, patients with OVAMP responses, ocular vamp responses, tend to have large amplitudes. So low threshold CVAMPs, large amplitude ocular vamps. Radiology, obviously a key part of understanding if there's a bony defect uh, in your patient whom you suspect a third window phenomenon. Uh, in our center, we ask for protocol SCD uh, views, which include uh, views in the plane of Puschel, which is parallel to the superior canal, as well as Stenvers, which is perpendicular to the superior canal. In both cases, we see evidence of a bony defect over the arcuate eminence, as well as a tegman tympany defect with contact of the dura to the ossicular heads. So two reasons maybe that this patient has an air bone gap. In the Stenvers view, we see a large um, uh, tegman uh, mastoidium defect as well as an arcuate eminence defect. We um, uh, described a series of patients in order to try to classify the CT findings in patients with superior canal distance. And these were papers published in 2011 and 2014. In the more recent paper from 2014, we looked at 202 patients with superior canal dehiscence syndrome, of which most were adult patients, 198 adults and four um, children were included. We looked at things like SCD location and uh, size, um, the presence of tegman defect, um, the presence of bone over the geniculate ganglion or the facial nerve at the skull base, excuse me, as well as the proximity of the defect in the superior canal to the superior petrosal sinus. So in the series, we found that 12% of these cases had tegman tympany defect, 38% uh, of these cases had a low-lying tegman, and 50% had a dehiscent facial nerve, had a dehiscent geniculate ganglion. And so one has to be extremely careful if a middle fossa approach is considered when dissecting in the area of the superior canal, because many of these patients will also have an associated exposed facial nerve at the level of the lateral skull base. And so to uh, review diagrammatically what the superior canal might look like, um, this is a normal superior canal. We have bone overlying the superior canal, including the area of the arcuate eminence. The superior patrols of science would be somewhere in this location right here. 
This would be the ampullated end of the superior canal, the ascending limb, the arcuate eminence, the, de the descending limb, and of course the common crus joining up with the limb of the posterior semicircular canal. Now the arcuate eminence defect is the most common subtype of superior canal dehiscence. And I encourage you as you see your own patients in your clinics and you're on your otology rotations to not just say, oh, there's a defect or not, but to try to describe its location. Is it at the level of the arcuate eminence? And in most cases, indeed, it is. In our series, 95% of patients had an arcuate eminence defect. Less common but important um, subtype is uh, the medial defect associated with the superior patrosal sinus closer to the area of the common cruise. And this was seen in about 4% of patients in our series. And so these patients do not have an arcuate eminence defect. And then uh, in one patient in one year of uh, 392 years that we examined, this uh, gentleman actually had two defects, an arcuate eminence defect, as well as a defect associated with the superior patrosal Science. And so surgery just to repair this may not necessarily improve his symptom complex. In fact, this patient underwent a transmaster repair. We performed labyrinthotomies here and here to isolate both defects, resulting in some mitigation of his symptoms. And, and he's done well. He's about six or seven years now post-op since that repair. So let's briefly talk about uh, management options. I'm just going to pull up the chat here. Great. So observations. So the majority of our patients that we see have mild symptoms or have symptoms that are not linked to the bony defect to see on imaging and should be observed. Um, surgery. Surgery is reserved for those patients with significant vestibular and or auditory uh, complaints. And I will tell you that although we haven't formally studied this particular research question, but we are doing it now, Patients who have primarily auditory symptoms, I think overall do better with a shorter recovery period. I think those who present with complex vestibular symptomatology um, have prolonged recoveries. And perhaps it's because they may have multiple contributing conditions um, that um, result in their presenting complex vestibular symptomatology. So surgery, middle fossa craniotomy with or without an endoscope, um, uh, the endoscope, we believe, is very helpful in being able to look around corners because the lateral skull base is not perfectly flat and is not per, per, uh, perfectly um, forgiving in terms of visual access with the microscope. And so the endoscope has been a, an important tool that we've added in the operating room for being able to visualize more complex defects. A transmaster repair is also a popular approach, and this can be uh, performed to be able to indirectly repair a defect or to directly repair a canal defect. And finally, round window plugging, uh, more controversial, and I think the outcomes are um, not quite so favorable there. So plugging or occlusion of the defect is really the most common approach used worldwide, and certainly the most common approach used by the three or four most um, um, experienced centers in the United States. This is oftentimes performed via middle fossa craniotomy approach. I like the approach because I can directly visualize a defect and fully characterize it visually and then directly repair without creating two new bony defects of the inner ear. And that drilling also brings you closer to the ampullated end of the superior canal, um, in addition to just, to just transmitting much more mechanical energy during the surgical approach. And so this diagram shows the evidence of an arcuate eminence defect that we've occluded with bone wax. And this is a post bone wax application. We used, in this case, this was a um, cadaveric uh, study. We used radio opaque bone wax to be able to appreciate the extent of the repair showing how a bone wax plug could repair the defect and isolate uh, uh, the transmission of energy to and from the defect uh, to the uh, superior canal. So that's occlusion or plugging of the defect. And this can be done through a middle fossil approach or through a transmastoid approach. This video illustrates uh, this um, uh, reviews uh, endoscopic assisted middle fossa approach for repair of canal dehiscence. A 62 year old gentleman with a left sided um, oral fullness as his main complaint and autophony. His imaging shows a defect of the arcuate eminence actually on a very steeply down sloping lateral skull base. Very challenging to see with a traditional microscopic approach. We use a small incision craniotomy and minimal uh, hair shave. 
So in binocular microscopy, we see uh, the dissection ongoing of the left ear. So this is going to be the um, tegmen and the mastoid. And uh, this is the lateral skull base, which you can see a very prominent um, overhang. So with a zero degree rigid endoscope, we're beginning to just see the defect, but not in its entirety. This is the dura of the middle fossa. We're then dissecting it to be able to appreciate the extent of the bony defect of the superior canal, again, on this left side. We then introduce an angled endoscope, which gives us a much better view and a much more on foss approach. You can even see the membranous labyrinth within the, the, um, the confines of the bony defect, a really fantastic view. And then we use, in our center, we generally use bone wax and we introduce this extremely slowly and gently to be able to occlude both the ascending and descending limbs. It's, it's critical to be able to occlude both ends or you might have a persistent area where a third one phenomenon uh, could uh, be present. And so slow application is key. No more than one or two uh, small diameter bone wax balls should be applied or you might over repair the defect and potentially introduce wax into the vestibule. And that has been reported as well. So be extremely cautious when using any repair material and the defect because it can migrate very easily. So in looking at our minimally invasive middle fossa approach, um, uh, we did a small study from 2013 and 2017 examining 105 cases uh, where middle fossa approaches were used um, applying this minimally invasive soft tissue approach. Um, mean follow-up was about nine months with no major wound infection or breakdown and no major complications, including permanent severe hearing loss, meningitis, stroke, or facial nerve uh, injury. And so a small soft tissue approach can yield significant exposure surgically. And so I encourage you to consider refining your middle fossil approaches if you do it uh, the old uh, fashioned way. What about the indirect repair approach, the transmaster approach, which I alluded to earlier in that uh, unusual subtype of canal dehiscence? In this case, a transmastoid approach is performed, so canal mastoidectomy. Uh, the um, superior canal is then gently blue lined. Uh, two holes are then made on either end of the superior canal to be able to isolate the defect, and then they are plugged with bone wax um, um, or soft tissue or uh, bone pate. This is again an indirect repair where we open up both uh, canal limbs and plug each one via labyrinthotomy. And I believe that this is an ideal approach in patients with the medial defect from the superior petrosal sinus. And so these medial defects from this sinus, uh, I think are much more challenging and potentially more dangerous when done middle fossa. Number one, you can't see very well that deep in the hole. Number two, you're dissecting around a vein which could bleed and you may have challenges to try to um, prevent bleeding or stop bleeding. Uh, during the dissection. So a transmastoid approach, I think, is really fantastic for these very medial defects. So you create two individual holes to isolate the dehiscence, and then you plug each hole. This is a brief video that highlights the approach. This is a right ear transmastoid repair. This is the um, tegmen mastoidium. This is the bony external auditory canal. Again, this is a right ear this is anterior, superior, posterior, and inferior. This is the horizontal semicircular canal. We blue lined the ampullated superior canal, and uh, we're now chasing down the descending limb of the superior canal, which is much more difficult to reach. It's always much, much further away, much deeper than you really think it is during this dissection. Uh, we then gently open up the inner ear, and I use a gentle introduction of bone wax and that is followed by a little blob of bone pate to finish and, and, and uh, the repair. And then we repeat the same maneuver on the other side um, as well. In fact, I think this side was already repaired. I generally start with the amplitude then first, and then I repair the descending limb second. And that's a transmastoid approach. What about resurfacing? I think resurfacing is something that's very important to discuss because it's something that we all strive for. This is what we want to ideally create. We want to be able to create a watertight seal of the defect to be able to preserve the lumen of the canal, to preserve fluid flow through the canal and preserve as much, much function as possible. So on paper, in theory, there is no question. This is what we all desire. In practice and reality, unfortunately, this is very difficult to achieve. 
And so Lloyd Miner in the early days, of course, tried to resurface some of these defects. And guess what? They didn't really work very well. Either A, they didn't work at all, or they worked for a short period of time because the repair would slip or the repair ended up not being as watertight as one wanted it to be. And there's no question a higher recurrence rate when a true resurfacing is performed. And we've seen a number of patients who've come to our center with persistent symptoms and their operative reports state that the defect was resurfaced. But when we do MRI scans of these defects, we see that in fact, these defects were partially plugged. So I believe that successful durable resurfacing is just another form of very gentle plugging and approach that we all try to strive for. But this also opens up many opportunities for thinking about how we can develop new technologies, new approaches to truly resurface and reconstitute these bony defects, because ideally this is what we want to achieve. Just layering on bone cement does not work. I've tried it, others have tried it. Uh, either it doesn't work and, uh, or it causes even a dead ear, as I've heard in a few cases, because of the exothermic reaction that occurs when the, the bone cement sets up. And so we don't have a great solution yet, um, but we are working on new technologies as are other groups as well to try to really resurface the canal. We want to do this, but we believe that plugging is a more long-term durable and safe way to achieve a clinical result that is favorable. What about round window plugging? Something that came into favor for a brief time, but has since probably fallen out of favor to some degree. And so um, this uh, is a short video that uh, at least highlights the surgical approach. And I don't uh, perform this procedure anymore, but uh, it can be done through a trans canal, either endoscopic assisted or microscopic approach. This is done endoscopically in this video. We're elevating a tympanometer flap, we're entering the middle ear, dissecting the fibrous annulus here in this left ear. This is anterior, posterior, superior, and inferior. We're identifying the os ossicles, incus, stapes, tendon, cochlea, and a pseudomembrane over the um, round window niche. We're then teasing off the pseudomembrane to get a better view, a, a, a direct visual of the true round window membrane itself. And I think this highlights, this video really does demonstrate a classic third window phenomenon. So what you just saw there was I was palpating the ossicles and looking at the area of the round window. The malleus moves, the incus moves, and the stapes moves. But the, the round window and the area here does not move at all. And so typically one wants to see a present round window reflex if everything is functioning normally, if the stapes is truly mobile. In this case, there is zero round window movement at all with large excursions of the incus. This is a classic uh, example of a third window phenomenon in action. You palpate the ossicles, there's zero movement at the round window. Why? Again, we have shunting of fluids away from the cochlear partition and towards a defect. So the cochlea is not seeing as much of the energy, but the canal is. And that's why you see the lack of round window movement. And that is why patients can have an air bone gap of conductive hearing loss. We're reinforcing, in this case, the niche and the membrane itself with a layer of perichondrum and a piece of auricular cartilage to follow. Outcomes have not been great though, and um, some patients have gotten worse after surgery. I performed the surgery in a woman who had bilateral canal distances, underwent successful first ear repair, she had some vestibular hypofunction after the first surgery, so we elected not to offer surgery for her other ear. She was very symptomatic from her other ear, so she wanted something done, so we tried the round window plugging. It helped her for about three months. She was happy. And then she returned to her baseline. She then was taken back to the OR at least two years later. I really gave her as much time as possible to recover from her first middle fossa approach and underwent uneventful contralateral middle fossa approach and plugging of her superior canal on the other side. So it's, it was an interesting case, a complicated case. I was hoping the round window would have done it for her, but it did not. And I can tell you that there, may, uh, there have been a few cases anecdotally of dead ears following a trans canal round window plugging. So this is not as benign of a procedure as it seems. So I don't think this is a great approach for patients as a first line approach for canal dehiscence. If you have patients with minor symptoms, mild symptoms, observation, is the best approach there. For those patients in whom you see in your practice who have failed brown window surgery and have SCD, we have shown that metal fossa craniotomy and SCD plugging to revise those patients 
can offer relief without stemming at risks to hearing or vestibular function. This is a paper we published last year. What about materials that can be used for the repair itself? Bone wax, bone chips, fascia strips, bone cement, you name it, people have tried everything. Uh, resurfacing, same idea, bone chip, cartilage strips, fascia, bone cement. A number of things have been tried, but in general, most of the things that we use to repair the canal does not really show up well if you wanna get a post-op CT scan to understand how well you did. And so for most patients who fail initial surgery, you can't really visualize the extent of that repair using just a CT scan after surgery. And so we uh, did a study to understand the utility of MRI scans to um, uh, characterize the extent of the repair. And so on the left is a, a pu uh, push all view CT scan of a normal superior canal. And the right panel shows the MRI scan from the same patient showing a normal fluid filled uh, superior canal. So you can ask for and obtain uh, reformats in the push L plane of the superior canal to be able to understand the fluid signal of the superior canal on heavily weighted um, fine cut T2 weighted MRI scans. And so in the study, we overlaid both CT and MRI scans to understand, did we do a good job repairing a patient? Or if a patient has had surgery and is having persistent symptoms, can we explain the persistence of symptoms to an inadequate repair. And so we're able to show that there is a correlation uh, between uh, a gap that might be seen between the repair as shown on the MRI scan and a CT scan overlay, which might help explain that perhaps some patients who have persistent symptoms may not have been fully plugged. And so really the take-home message here is that the T2-weighted MRI scan is super useful in SCD patients, especially in the push L plane. And it's very useful to check your work after SCD repair. In fact, at our institution, we routinely perform an MRI scan either on the night of surgery or on the day after surgery to be able to at least interrogate the system, so to speak, to be able to, to, to measure our repair uh, immediately after surgery. And that way we can compare that to any future scans should a patient have recurrence of symptoms. So briefly to review our mass sign, your experience, and this was data up to 2017. We're still analyzing the data from the past uh, two and a half years or so. This was a total of 183 patients. Of these, the majority were middle fossa craniotomy approaches, uh, less commonly were transmastoid, and nine were round window plugging cases. Uh, in most cases, there were 160 were primary cases for SUD, and 23 were revision cases, either from our own practice or from referrals from other centers. Mean age of surgery is 49 years. Uh, there are 100, 103 women and 80 uh, men, so um, slightly biased towards women. Uh, middle fossa approach was the most common approach. 81% of cases were performed via middle fossa craniotomy approach, and most were left ears. Um, again, uh, there were 13% of these cases were revision uh, cases. In all cases, we were able to visualize the entire a uh, defect uh, because we oftentimes will use the endoscope as well as the microscope to be able to appreciate the entire defect. Uh, we had no cases of permanent facial nerve injuries following surgery and no um, cases of CSF leak. So does the uh, surgical repair of SCD improve the chief complaint? And this is an early paper we published about eight years ago, looking at initial uh, an earlier cohort of 33 patients of which most were plugged and one was resurfaced and most were done via middle fossa craniotomy. Uh, in this uh, study, we saw that the chief complaint was improved in all 33 patients. There was recurrence of symptoms seen in three patients, of which revision surgery improved those chief complaints in two out of three cases. What about factors associated with a longer recovery following SCD surgery? And I'll, just, I'll get right to the punchline here in this other paper. We looked at six patients in which dizziness lasted for more than four months after SCD repair. All six patients had bilateral canal dehiscences, large bony defects, larger than three millimeters as measured on CT scans, and a migraine history. All six patients also happen to be female as well. Um, so um, in general, when we talk to patients, if they have these sorts of risk factors, we really hammer down the point that, hey, you, surgery may be helpful, but you may expect a longer, more difficult recovery because of what we know about our previous experience with canal dehiscence with these patients and these uh, comorbid, comorbid factors. What about long-term hearing and CBEM outcomes following SCD repair? Uh, 
CVAMP thresholds generally normalize following SCD surgery. So thresholds on CVAMP generally are low and they become higher following surgery. And this was significant at 250, 500, 750, and 1000 hertz. We do multiple tone burst CVAMP thresholds at our institution. What about the hearing? Well, a post-operative closure of the ear bone gap was also observed in the majority of patients, I'm looking at 30 patients following surgery, comparing them to their preoperative values as shown by the um, solid line. Majority had a closure of their air bone gap. What about bone conduction thresholds? Well, we did observe that in some patients there was a mild high frequency sensory hearing loss observed after SCD surgery. These patients subjectively on the surveys did not report hearing loss, but there was a clearly a demonstration of some degree of high frequency primarily sensory neural hearing loss seen following SCD repair. And this was a, a, um, an observation that was shared by other centers with large cohorts of patients who've had SCD surgery. So briefly conclude, surgery is a reasonable and safe option for patients with severe symptoms of, of SCD. We, we believe that classifying uh, CT scan findings are critical to be able to number one, standardize descriptions of SCD, as well as to pull outcomes, and as well to optimize and plan your surgical approach should surgery be indicated. We believe that the repair approach is effective in improving the chief complaint, in closing the airbone gap and to normalize or elevate CVM thresholds uh, but plugging does have its risks. Um, some patients do experience a mild high frequency hearing loss shown on post-op hearing testing and some patients do have persistent dizziness. I didn't have time to present all the other published data, but uh, certainly um, patients um, have greater satisfaction in terms of their auditory symptoms than they do with their vestibular symptoms. Risk factors for delayed recovery include those patients with bilateral bony defects, those with large canal defects, as well as those uh, with a, a migraine a history. And finally, endoscopy, we believe, really enables a wide angle view of the lateral skull base, um, which is far and vastly superior to the microscope. And we believe it helps reduce craniotomy size and reduce brain retraction because of the better view afforded by an endoscopic assisted approach to the lateral skull base when using a metal fossa craniotomy uh, approach. So that was part one of my talk. We have uh, just under 20 minutes uh, left, and so I'll briefly take some questions before we start on a few cases of canal dehiscence. Okay, so uh, one question was, how does the indirect repair with multiple labyrinthotomies and patching solve the initial third window phenomenon from patrol, superior patrols of science defects without obstructing flow through the posterior canal? Uh, I'm not so clear on the question, but I, I think you're referring to the actual surgical approach. Um, let me just go ahead and exit the talk and go to the slide, which highlights the transmastoid approach. And so generally we wanna create a second labyrinthotomy right about here and avoid the common cruise or the posterior canal. And so it's hard to really gauge how much we're repairing during surgery. The materials that we use are not uh, dark enough, are not opaque enough for us to be able to see through trans translimination through the bone to understand how far the repair material has migrated towards the posterior canal, towards the common cruise. So we would isolate the defect with a small labyrinthotomy here to stay away from the ampulla and right here. And there's no question there might be a risk of some migration of repair material towards the common cruise or maybe even towards the posterior canal. And these are all risks that we have to share with our patients that there is a risk of um, vestibular hypofunction or dysfunction after surgery. We know from our colleagues in Baltimore that when you do a plugging of the superior canal, you don't eliminate its function in many cases you alter its function. You uh, still maintain its sensitivity to high frequency head oscillation in the plane of that canal, which is critical for normal day-to-day -day movement of the head, but you do dampen some of the low frequency oscillation sensitivity. And so, so there is um, influence, there is modification of that function. The function is altered, but not necessarily permanently. 
And so again, if you're going to be doing this labyrinthotomy indirect approach with a medial defect, we have to be very careful not to overclude the area to, this, to the, to the um, participant's uh, question and potentially affect yet another canal function. Uh, another question, but was a comment from one of my residents saying that do not expect to get trash talked to this hard during the presentation. <laughs> Sorry, I had to bring up the kickball tournament, but it, it just had to be said. So if there are no other additional questions, we'll go ahead and just briefly go over a case or two. And um, so let's see here. Okay. Case studies. Great, let me get these other windows out of the way. So um, the first is a 52 year old one who presented to my practice with a low, with complaints that low frequency sounds made her head swim. Started five years ago, accompanying an upper respiratory infection. She says that singing can provoke symptoms of dizziness and imbalance. We um, conduct a number of SCD specific questions um, that are templated in our EPIC system to be able to, to hone in on some of the um, concerns that these patients might experience. Um, oral fullness, left-sided, yes. Dizziness with sounds, yes, to low frequency or loud sounds. No dizziness on straining or exertion, no history of migraines, and singing triggers uh, dizziness. These are uh, her clinical tests of hearing as well as balance function. So um, what is your interpretation of these tests? So on the left side, on this threshold audiogram, we see that there's an air bone gap and that we see that there is supranormal bone conduction at minus 10 and minus 5 dB at 250, 500, and 1000 hertz, a classic presentation of a patient um, with possible superior canal dehiscence syndrome. So please ask your audiologist to test at these low threshold um, bone conduction levels if they don't already do so to be able to tease out those patients who have ear complaints and may have a third window phenomenon from canal dehiscence. These are the VEMP threshold measurements. We measure at 250, 500, 750, and 1000 hertz. Thresholds for cervical VEMPs in this case were 55 and 60s for the left ear and 85s across the board for the right ear. Would you consider these to be abnormal compared to the right ear? I would say yes. And so um, we uh, performed in this case a cone beam CT scan. This is the push all view of the left superior canal. And this demonstrates what? A bony defect of the superior semicircular um, uh, canal. Let's see here. I'm just, I think I just was asked another question here. So uh, one question was, um, just to get to the, the, um, this attendee before we finish the talk, um, asking about how re, uh, round window surgery could improve SC symptoms. Um, it seems that reinforcing the round window would force more of the fluid energy to be translated into the canal and worsening symptoms. Indeed, that is possible. And the idea was that if you have thir three windows that are mobile, if you occlude the round window or stiffen it, you then give the patient back two windows, but you've clearly altered the overall physiology of the inner ear. And I think that's why the uh, clinical outcomes have been all over the map. Um, and so it is certainly a, um, a topic that is controversial, uh, but I think our studies of the human inner ear in fresh human temporal bone models led by Heidi Nakajima at Mass Ioneer would support the idea that you really need to occlude the round window significantly to truly alter it to the point where you've created effectively now two windows. And the problem is if you clinically include the round window uh, too aggressively, you risk sensory or hearing loss and worsening of SCD symptoms. So uh, it's, it's no free lunch there. Dr. Gupta, you had a comment? No, none for me, thank you so much. Okay, uh, just going on to this case. So then how would you manage this patient? Left ear symptoms, air bone gap, low threshold vamps, um, bony defect. 
This was a person who had significant symptoms and motivated for surgery. She, she did undergo uh, surgery uh, via metal fossa craniotomy approach and plugging of her defect. And this was her three month post op audiogram on the right, showing closure of her prior airbone gap. And no longer does she have any abnormal hypersensitivity to bone conducted sounds. Her post op VEMPs, um, uh, her pre op VEMP was again 55 and 60s, and her post op VEMP was 85 across the board and mirrors the unaffected normal right side. So very good um, clinical test outcome. And certainly subjectively, she's doing well following surgery. She's now, I think, three or four years post-op. Case number two, this is a, um, a patient with um, older, 73-year-old with dizziness, lightheadedness, and vertigo, and nausea and vomiting lasting five or six hours at a time. He reports hearing loss on the right side. Yes, I have dizziness when I strain. I have vertigo, episodic, lasting for hours. Yes, I hear my heartbeat in my ear. My right ear might be bad, maybe the left ear. I do not hear my eyes moving or footfalls, or I don't hear much autophony, and I don't have any dizziness with loud sounds. On his examination, his Weber was midline, um, and um, his RINA was positive bilaterally. Uh, we couldn't trigger any um, symptoms or nystagmus to pneumatic otoscopy or Valsalva against closed glottis. His hearing testing on the left shows a threshold audiogram suggesting A, sensory normal hearing loss, downsloping, fairly symmetric. His VEMP thresholds um, show on the left side um, anywhere from 75 to 90 dB HL, and on the right side, um, 85 to 100 dB HL. His CT scans, and this is the reason why he was sent to see me, is because an outside provider obtained CT scans because of some of his symptoms. And uh, he was found to have very thin bone on the right on this coronal CT scan and possibly a small defect on the left in these coronal CT scan bony windows. So right ear, thin bone, left ear, possible pinpoint dehiscence. So how would you manage this patient? He's desperate, he wants relief, he wants surgical repair because he hears that from other patients that this dehiscence can cause dizziness and surgery can help them. So the outcome on further questioning is symptoms and episodes were actually triggered by the good old fashioned New England clam chowder. And so we gave him a diagnosis of Meniere's disease. And in fact, he responded very well over time to diuretics and a low salt a diet. So just because you have a hole doesn't mean you have to repair it, no matter what the patient wants, no matter what your referring physician wants you to do. I'll finish with my, with my last case in the, in, the, in the final eight minutes of this presentation. This is an interesting gentleman who came to see me um, with history of recurrent symptoms uh, soon after a primary middle fossa craniotomy approach and canal dehiscence repair. And so a 52 year old gentleman with chronic dizziness and pulsatile tinnitus left worse than right ear. It began at least two decades before his first procedure. His first surgery was done in 2008, uh, done in an outside institution, I think about uh, 12 hours or so east of Kentucky. Um, and uh, symptoms improved initially, but then returned after one or two weeks post-surgical repair. He reports oral fullness, definitely mostly on the left side. Yes, doc, I hear dizziness with sound, dizziness when I exert myself and I strain. I don't have migraine headaches, and yes, I have lots of autophony type uh, sensations. He presented with his wife um, to the office, and she was really the one who drove um, him to consider um, coming for initial surgery locally as well as coming for another opinion um, because of his symptoms. And this is um, uh, really in direct relationship to this individual's uh, avocation on the weekends. He is a drag car racer. And so this is uh, uh, an image that uh, my patient sent to me, and this is him, the driver behind the wheel of this uh, modified Mustang tuned to 900 horsepower. Due to insurance issues, they only race one eighth mile, not one quarter mile anymore. And so um, he can do one eighth of a mile in about 5.8 seconds. So that translates into about 122 miles per hour in 5.8 seconds. Um, move aside, Tesla Model S. Um, this thing is a rocket ship. And so the wife told me that after these drag races, he would finish the race. Thankfully, it's a straight line race, of course. 
and then uh, uh, the parachute would deploy, the brakes would be engaged. He would then turn over and go back to the garage, but he would notice, she would notice that he would be swerving back and forth after the race because of the significant, you can imagine, Tulio phenomenon associated with being behind the wheel of a 900 horsepower modified Ford Mustang. Really, really crazy stuff. If you look at his license plate, I mean, it doesn't get better than that. Sucking gas and hauling ass. And he was someone who loves to race and wanted to get back on the race uh, car track. And so um, they came to us for an opinion. So his uh, pre-op revision audiogram, um, so this was before his second surgery, this was done here in Boston, shows this finding. Clearly a lot of um, noise related damage um, from the high frequency losses you can see in here, but on the lower frequency spectrum, we see an air bone gap and even supra normal bone conduction in several frequencies on the operated side. We didn't have any good um, pre-op audiograms available from his first surgery done elsewhere. His tympanometry was normal. Reflexes were also present and normal in both ears. His VEMP testing uh, is uh, shown here and my window covers up the numbers here. Okay, great. And so uh, these, is, again, a four frequency um, uh, VEMP test, cervical VEMP test showing lower thresholds on the left side compared to the right side, but not pathologically low. So perhaps the VEMPs were slightly altered as a consequence of the first operation. This was his CT scan that we, we performed before his surgery, his revision surgery. And you can see that uh, some bone cement likely was used to help repair parts of the tegman defect. We can see the arcuate eminence defect as shown here. And this coronal CT scan, again, uh, performed after his first surgery, before his second surgery. And uh, this was an MRI scan that we performed at that time, showing fluid-filled arcuate eminence on the unoperated side and a small fluid void on the operated side, suggesting that a partial plugging may have been performed in this left ear. Again, looking at higher magnification of this left MRI scan T2 weighted image, axial cuts, a slight fluid void suggesting a partial plugging may have been um, achieved with the first surgery. So we thought that perhaps there would have been an area that we could potentially reinforce to complete the repair of, of his defect. This was his, again, his pre op CT scan from his pre op from his uh, revision surgery, again, showing um, uh, some air actually in the superior canal in the area where the repair was performed. And so we concluded that perhaps there was an area that we could reinforce through revision surgery. And so we use 3D uh, scan reconstructions to be able to delineate the nature of the defect using both MRI and CT imaging data as highlighted by the orange circle to appreciate that there was potentially a persistent defect using MRI and CT scan overlay. The green area shows a fluid signal suggesting that perhaps one of the limbs is still open and that's what's driving the third window phenomenon. And so again, we performed an indirect approach transmastoid to isolate the dehiscence. I emailed him uh, not long ago and uh, asked him how he was doing. And he says, hey doc, I'm doing okay. Ear is better than it was before your operation. I'm thinking the other ear is messing up now. At times, you can hear my heartbeat again in the uh, right ear, the unoperated ear. Uh, dizziness overall is better in one respect, but worse as I turn my head or close my eyes or in darkness which we thought might happen. So probably some slight vestibular hypofunction from having two operations in the same ear. He doesn't know if it's coming from that ear or from the other ear. And so this is uh, this wonderful gentleman um, from Oklahoma. And um, he concluded his message with a uh, video from the race car track. And here he is back on the track, probably three years post-surgery. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. Uh, amazing video. So that concludes my presentation this morning. Um, thanks to all for participating and listening in uh, today. And thank you again to the organizers for the invitation uh, to speak. We may have a minute or two for a final question or comment. Uh, again, thank you. Any final comments or questions? <laughs>
Well, again, I think that wraps it up for me. Thanks again.